Here's what Martin Scorsese said in a famous quote, my whole life has been movies and religion. That's all, nothing else. The movie we're about to see this morning is a testimony to that fact. If there is any movie that invites theological dialogue, surely it's silence. I tell people that you should not go see this film alone. Um, you need to go with a friend, you need to go with your group, and you need time to process it together, uh, probably like months. There's this French film theorist, Michel Chion, and he says that the last remaining religious space in the modern world is the closing credits of a movie. Because there's no other place any longer where we get together with people, with a community, have a common experience, and then are forced in darkness to reflect upon that shared experience. So I'd like to thank you for coming, for joining us in this apparently last religious space in the entire world. But also I'm excited for the conversation that we're about to have. Will you join me in welcoming the co-writer and director of the film we just watched, Silence, Martin Scorsese. You have said, and maybe it's apocryphal, that the whole of your life has been movies and religion. Um, well, that was the second half of a statement. Oh, what's the first half? I forget that now. Oh, okay, so good. <laughs> I said it's a little unbalanced, but <laughs> yeah, it's, it's true in a way, in the well, foundation, that's true. The reason I bring it up is because you could probably use that statement as the life statement for a number of people sitting here. Mm. We represent basically friends, faculty, students, alumni of the Fuller Seminary community. Is there any difference between screening a film for a, a larger audience, a regular audience, and being back and maybe hearkening back to your days as a 19-year-old in seminary, thinking about going into the priesthood? What's it like to screen a film and talk to a group of seminarians? It's somehow very different, I think, because the, I... How should I put it? I had hoped that that this would um, reach you in that sense. And I'd hoped that it's something that you would be open to, but also, how should I say, um, not uh, something that is um, a narrow in a way, wider for the whole world uh, through you. You see, this was the idea. I, I thought to put it out there and to see the people who really had faith, people who really understand this situation, understand the situation of the world the way it is now, that it'd be really interesting to have something that would open up uh, serious, uh, enlightening discussions around the world. That's what I thought. It's certainly different from showing uh, uh, the film to um, a lay audience, so to speak, you know, which, by the way, we've been getting very strong reactions to, really strong, you know, um, in, in L.A. and... New York is quite quite interesting. Yeah, I was at the landmark. I think when when you screened it there, uh -huh. um, and just overwhelmed by the reception. Um, and I think there you mentioned you'd screened it for the Pope in the Vatican. <laughs> well, yes, uh, yeah, I, he didn't attend. Oh. Yes, <laughs> we said we're screening at five. Holy you, you met him. You met him later. <laughs> no, I met him early in the morning, actually, and um, uh, he was very gracious. And uh, uh, he, he, uh, I gave him. Um, a copy of the painting of the Madonna of the Snows. Yeah, and also also the the, the Japanese scroll painting of, um, obviously a copy, of uh, the martyrdom of the, of the uh, Jesuits, 1622, which the original hangs in the Jesu, uh, uh, you know. And um, uh, it was really very sweet. He blessed my family and us, and uh, I then opened the doors, and there were about 200 cardinals sitting there, and he was about to uh, have a meeting. <laughs> 
<laughs> he said, pray for me, I can use it. <laughs> But he did hope, he, he said, I would love to see the film, but he, he'd hoped that, you know, the film, he, as he put it, it bears much fruit in a way, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, he was, I asked him if he'd ever been in Nagasaki. No, only Tokyo. But I know, I believe he wanted to be a missionary yeah. in Nagasaki, right? And, yeah. Right. Um, and so everything was quite, was quite remarkable. That evening, the film was shown at the Palazzo San Carlo, which is a, actually smaller than this room. Big screen, pretty big screen, and above it was a, uh, a life-size crucifix, and uh, stunning, you know, about maybe 75 people. I, I do not exaggerate when I say multiple people, when they found out you'd join us, um, have said you, as a filmmaker, have been one of the most, if not the most, theologically formative voices in their life. Mm. Um, and when you think of a film, you know, saying all the different hurdles that you encountered, it does just strike me that there is a, such a time as this. I feel that way about the Pope, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. he, as the Pope, is at such a time as this, mm. both Protestants, Catholics, Christians worldwide need that kind of Pope, and we exactly. need this kind of film. Yeah. What would you say, if you were going to boil it down into one or two things, what is that core spiritual conversation you're asking us to have walking out of this theater? Um, well, I guess it's the conversation I had myself and the book um, since 1989, what does ultimately approaching um, Christianity from many different angles in my whole life, an uh, adolescent childhood, adolescence, and all sorts of things through the 60s, by the way, where there were lots of disruptions. Uh, <laughs> uh, things started to change in the 70s, where we started making these wild films in, in Los Angeles here. Uh, approaching it from so many ways, how does one, if you're not, able to, or you're not um, really uh, a clergy, let's say, or you're not given your life uh, to that calling, to that vocation. How does one then really express and live true Christian life, especially in a world, the world I come from? Now, I grew up in a very tough area, um, and I saw the worst, yes, there was lots of violence, but the worst thing was the um, thinking, the medieval kind of um, tribal way of thinking that was mitigated by a number of religious people who were in my life, particularly one priest who was a young priest who came to the St. Patrick's Old Cathedral. I wanted to be like him, so I thought I'd be going to the diocesan priesthood. But when I was 15, I was in this uh, preparatory seminary, and I immediately failed out because I realized, I realized the vocation is something not because you want to be like this person. That person could be inspiring to you, but... Uh, it has to be a true vocation. There were other things in your mind. You had, I was obsessed with cinema. And, uh, a lot of this came from my asthma, which isolated me from a lot of people. Um, and so then if you take up that life and you, you deal with the stories that I dealt with uh, and parts of you, a lot of you is, is there. Father Principe, this priest who was my kind of tutor in a way for a long mentor, I should say, he talked about the difference in certain kinds of Mediterranean Christianity or Catholicism. And he felt the beauty of the Mediterranean one is that if you fail and you uh, you fall, korobu, if you do, he said, the thing is that you're not damned for life. The idea is to you get up again and you try your best, and if you fail again, you fail again, <laughs> and you try your best. And, that was, and he, he knew the book, by the way. Uh, and I haven't seen him uh, in a while now, but and that was very interesting to me. There are those, he said, who feel that if they fail, um, they're doomed. There's no sense in trying to, uh, to do anything. In any event, I, I, the whole idea is how to live a Christian, how to live uh, Christianity in daily life. How does one do it? And... Uh, over the years, it took many, many years to make this picture and to come to terms with it. And a lot of it had to do with my own life changing. Like getting married again and uh, having a child that uh, uh, I'm 74 now, since so she's just turned 17. It's, it's a different uh, experience when you have a child late in life. And so things start to, the values start to change. And uh, uh, maybe it's just the working out from person to person. It's being there. It's almost like that movie I made, Bringing Out the Dead. 
with the Nick Cage, uh, um, in which ultimately the EMS guys, the men and women in the EMS, you know, blast their way through the city at night, all night, taking care of people who are dying, taking care of people who are suffering. And ultimately, um, I remember uh, Nick, uh, the character, it starts with him on the verge of a nervous breakdown saying, it's been three days and I haven't brought anybody back to life. Well, he's not God. But he, he, he see somehow God has turned from him. And ultimately, he realizes he's got to be just a witness. He says he calls it a grief mop. We go there and we just mop up the grief. That's what we do. We can't stop at all. Um, but in any event, um, those are the thoughts that, uh, that I thought would be the idea of how um, hmm, we don't make religion something that's foreign, that's separate from life. That's the key. Yeah, it's really interesting to, um, to hear you talk about your vocation out of the priesthood, and yet you told stories that are all saturated spiritually and ended up shaping the very seminarians and priests and pastors <laughs> that, you know, that you were sort of feeling that wasn't your vocation. I, I find that fascinating. And part of it's what you're getting at here of, of how do we, uh, that's sort of the in the trenches reality that, that maybe the incarnation mm-hmm. is calling us to. Mm-hmm. And it strikes me, Mako, I, um, that that's defines in some ways, both of you as, if you're making movies in Hollywood, but you're asking spiritual questions, or you're a visual artist in the arts, you know, the sort of postmodern art scene, and yet you're explicit about a faith commitment, you're trafficking in these various marginalizations. So I wonder if you could say a bit, how did this movie, because of the novel being so influential in your life, how did it shed sort of new light into your work as an artist? Thanks, Carter. Um, what you did in this film is such a courageous uh, gift to many of us who labor to be pure, you know, to, to seek after, not after the market necessarily. It's, it's not after some kind of success model of the world, but it's purely this calling. You know you have to do it, but there are many battles that you went through. And I was just struck with your heart toward this journey. The thing that kept me going trying to crack the story in terms of the last 20 minutes of the picture, really. Uh, I didn't know how to visualize it. I didn't know even what it really, what did it really mean? And I don't know. I'm not saying I didn't understand it. I understood it, but I couldn't verbalize it. I couldn't put it on the page. I couldn't put it on screen. Now, for those of you who do not know, this last 20 minutes is after the Fumie mm-hmm. stepping. Mm-hmm. And it's the part that often people don't even read. <laughs> I know, the epilogue. <laughs> so you spend 20 minutes yeah. on that. Therefore, it's important yes, for it you. it really is. And also the Fumie scene, yeah. the, the idea of what, how, uh, what that means. And uh, uh, I know Gary Wills talked about uh, a, a man who, who gives up his faith in order to gain his faith. What exactly is that? And um, that's a ter- that's a a big that's a big choice. That's a big choice and a pretty scary journey, you know. Yet he finds the true Christianity, and so for me, this is why I couldn't make the picture. Uh, and in a way, I was very nervous and very upset about all the legal issues and promises that I had made to make the movie, and I was being sued. I wasn't making. I didn't have the script, but. Um, I kept holding on to it, knowing that somehow things were going to, uh, and it happened, things were going to fall away. And the important issues would come up forefront in my life, not just in, in the work I do. Well, the work I do is my life too, so. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's this powerful suggestion that the most faithful and obedient act is to apostatize. And it's scandalous especially to religious people, especially to Christians, um, because we have this sort of uh, high-minded, pristine notion of both God and Jesus. And yet one of the most powerful scenes, both in the book and your film, is when it's Jesus calling him to Mm, say, step on me, that is why I'm here, right? Obviously, that's a a, a turning point of the film. That's the the focal point. But could you say a little bit about um, your own just <laughs> struggle to, to film that? How hard is it to, to get there and say, okay, I've, I've gone through all the process, now here it is realized? Well, um, that, what- it's, a, it's a good question because that, when I, when I was on the bullet train from uh, Tokyo to Kyoto, and when I read that scene, I said, I've got to make this film, but how do I do that? How do I do the voice of Jesus? He has ears. 
I mean, you know, and I know cinema fairly well, and I know all the religious <laughs> films going from the greats like Dreyer and Bresson and those who went all the way up through, you know, um, um, DeMille and the other the other style, which I loved when I was a kid, but I, um, I tried to uh, uh, react against because I felt that the idea of Christianity had to be reinvented in, in cinema in a way to make to make um, uh, to make it um, uh, accessible to the, the young generation to the to the you know to take away the glorious music to take away even in the in temptation of Christ to take away the beautiful language from the Bible you know so you have guys with the Brooklyn accents and southern you know well that's what it was like in ancient Judea mm-hmm. In Galilee, uh, you know, if you came from Galilee and you went to Jerusalem, they knew immediately if you're from Galilee, just from your tongue and and your accent. So, you know, uh, but so all of this, but um, I'm digressing a bit. Um, uh, Yes, what does one do with the voice? That was the key, I thought. And ultimately, do I really understand about that apostasy and what it means? Um, as the years went by, as I made well, Gangs of New York and then The Aviator and then, then Departed, the picture Departed, and then at the end of Departed, things got so rough. Uh, the world that I found myself in, and I've said this before, that I felt that we were at a kind of moral ground zero. And I don't know what to think. I just couldn't wait to get over the film. And I went, I went ahead then immediately and uh, shot a concert with the Rolling Stones. <laughs> I said, I'm out of here. <laughs> that's life, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so that's it. So what I'm saying is that somehow that really helped make me realize it was the end. Where do I go to find the meaning of existence, the meaning of life, and that for me is Christianity, and uh, that's the real saving grace of, 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 our, of our world, of our species, really. And I think, uh, then what is it? What do we have to do to really make Christianity real, to realize it? How do we behave? What do we do? What do we say? Okay, we make mistakes, but then we move back. And so for me, it starts from the foot soldier level. It starts with you individually. And if it could be to your wife, to your friends, to your kids, good, if you can work that out. You know, but I did find that it was, I also found reading a lot in the past 20 years, particularly from different, uh, well, not French, but mainly English and American books and uh, history, I found the uh, coming across some wonderful stuff, but um, authors um, apologizing for Christian attitude. You know, another one saying, this seems disturbingly Christian. <laughs> disturbingly? All right, now, is, is that getting into the politics of it? Or does, does it mean that compassion and love for, for each other is wrong? And what else is going to happen? If we don't have that, species is over. Part of why I think most of us are here is our interaction with Inda, with the novel, that it captures something of the sort of spiritual state that we're in. And that is this, I can only describe it as, as post-traumatic. Yeah. That we all, both both religion, faith, Christianity, society, politics, all of it, we're grappling with what do we do post-trauma? And every day we're re-traumatized. And if the incarnation, if Jesus isn't speaking to that trauma, why are we here? I've heard you say a few times that you're, you want to explore and interrogate um, the contradictions and the ambiguities of faith while remaining rooted in your Christian faith. If you were going to speak to us and say, here's one piece of wisdom as a filmmaker, person of faith, and leave us with that, what might that be? Well, that's a, a tall one, but I, um, <laughs> it, it, it's in the films, I think. There's no doubt. Um, as Raging Bull, for example, ultimately he, uh, he sits in front of a mirror and, and repeats the monologue from On the Waterfront in which somehow he seems to come to some sort of peace with himself. He seems to forgive himself, and maybe that's where we have to begin. Forgive ourselves. We could be, we can be loving to others. You see, we don't have to punish the others around us in many different ways. You don't have to just do it with fists and uh, abusive language. In many different ways, you, you could. And for me, it's it's weathering, weathering all the problems um, of um, 
over the centuries and all the issues that have come up about Christianity, um, the Protestant, Catholic, uh, you know, the same in a sense, and all the issues, uh, political issues, all sorts of weathering all that negative, combative spirit that's now around, oh, many years really, weathering it so that we protect that kernel of faith in ourselves. Maybe that by having it tested constantly, we might find the truth of it, you know. Yet I know the truth is within the behavior of yourself in daily life. I know it has to be there because if we don't, what do you do? I mean, it's, it's a thing of, uh, you know, the missionaries here, they go there and, and uh, there's a, um, there was a, uh, a Philippine Monsignor Cardinal in Rome at the Jesuit screening. And he talked about, uh, somebody mentioned that the Japanese are going to be upset about the way they're portrayed. And he got up and he talked about the Japanese, yes, being very cruel in the film. He said, but one has to understand that um, when the missionaries came there, the Europeans, um, they presented their truth with a quotes on it, um, which negated the truth of the culture that they were preaching to. Um, and he said, uh, everything that they knew and lived for and all their whole life, everything they know is not true. We have the truth. And in, in this case, the Japanese saw it as uh, arrogance. And therefore, they had to take down the arrogance, he said. And it was, in a sense, that arrogance was a violence to the people, just as the uh, cruelty was to, uh, from the Japanese to the missionaries and the others. Uh, he also pointed out that you know colonialism is tied um, inextricably, unfortunately, still tied to Christianity. And he said that wound, still, he used the phrase, that wound still hasn't healed yet. So I thought, well, yeah, okay, then how do you, how do you spread the word? How do, you, how do you make the change? Well, isn't it in behavior? Isn't it like somebody, you know, hanging around somebody? I'd like to be like so-and-so's cousin. They really were, when I was in difficulty, they came, helped me out, or they just sat there, didn't say anything, but they just sat there. I mean, there's something about our behavior I know it sounds small, but it, it's not easy. It's not easy. If you ever go to uh, deal with people who are sick or you go to a hospital, talk. how do you do that? It's very hard. But that's where it begins. And that's where we get to the truth of it and, and compassion and love. And that other, without that, there won't be any species. Do you all join me in thanking Martin Scorsese once again? Thank you. Thank you so much.